So I'm really excited uh, to welcome our next speaker to the stage, Marcos Melitzis, uh, who was last year, uh, I think, in the same hall, right? When we were last at, when PDF was here, we moved uptown. We came back here three years ago. Uh, so Marcos Melitzis is probably uh, best known for starting Daily Coast, which is the biggest and uh, most vibrant political blog in the United States. Uh, about 250,000 registered users on the site, and an unbelievable community. I think it, it should be thought of as a small city, uh, uh, and a very, very active one. And using the word blog to describe it uh, is almost a misnomer. Um, it's more like a collaboration engine. Um, and Marcus is here, Marcus, come on up, um, is here to talk to us about something that he's going to be unveiling very soon, which is the redesign of the Daily Coast website. He started before social media really existed and now is in a world uh, where we're drenched and swimming in it. Um, and so what I'm looking forward to hearing is how he has rethought the, the role of his site and the design of it in this context of a whole new media system. He has been ahead of the curve in understanding how we use the technology to develop online community, in his case, for political activism. But I think there's also a larger message here about how we think about media in a networked age. Marcos Melitzis. So Daily Coast 4 is uh, it's sort of my vapor. I mean, it's, it's been imminent. You know, The release has been imminent for years now. So, uh, and it's still in beta testing. So I'm not going to talk so much about Daily Coast 4 specifically, but I will talk about the factors that have allowed me to create what is, I think, the most vibrant and engaged community uh, of any news or information site on the Internet. And, uh, and those factors are sort of what I will be working to uh, magnify as I move forward with Daily Coast 4. I, I, I had a presentation, I had PowerPoint thing here, um, but, uh, you know, I came in from the West Coast, I was up at 1 o'clock in the morning, local time, trying to go to sleep, impossible. So I was going to just do a little tinkering with my speech. I ended up rewriting it completely. So what I have on the presentation no longer applies to what I'm actually going to talk about. So it's just going to be me. And uh, Daily Coast is uh, eight years old. It just turned eight years old, which is 56. That's 56 in dog years, and it's uh, about 2,000 years in internet years. and. Uh, it, you know, I started the site in 2002, which, if any of you are progressive, you, you remember that as a very difficult and trying time for progressives. I mean, it was a very difficult political environment where criticizing the president on any issue was considered akin to treason uh, and being un-American. And uh, I don't say this right now to start a political debate or to rehash those battles, because this is not a political speech, but this was sort of my frame of mind, and that was my frustration of the moment. And I felt neglected and ignored. And I despaired not just for the politics and of my nation and my country and for the progressive movement, which was non-existent at the time, but I also despaired for the news media. And, and I grew up a huge news junkie. Uh, growing up in, uh, in suburban Chicago, I, I, had, I got my parents to get me subscriptions to both the Chicago Tribune and the Sun-Times. And I didn't realize then just how expensive newspaper subscriptions were. My parents were working class, so it was a big sacrifice for them. But this was important for me, and, and they encouraged that from the very beginning. I thought I was going to be a journalist. I thought I was going to be a reporter. One of my degrees is in one of my majors was journalism. I was a stringer for the Chicago Tribune. And my life took a different approach, but at the time I really thought I was going to be one of these investigative journalists that newspapers love to talk about, but you never see in the wild anymore. I mean, they sure didn't exist in 2002 as Bush was taking our nation to war. But what I did see was the media turn into the biggest, loudest, dissent-crushing, flag-waving cheerleaders of anybody for this impending war in Iraq. And why, why wouldn't they? Because this was exciting stuff. It was fantastic for ratings. And for an industry that was hurting, that was losing viewers and losing readers, uh, the prospect of shock and awe and missiles over Baghdad, and parades, and, and flower petals. I mean, this was really powerful stuff. They couldn't wait to get started. And nobody spoke out against that. And that, that was the problem. The media and the progressive establishment itself were completely AWOL in that debate. They failed America in the process. 
And that's sort of the bottom line. This is why Daily Kos exists, because there was a huge market failure. While I may have felt that I was all alone in my anger as my country slid to war, it turns out that I wasn't. And I figured that out really quickly after launching Daily Kos. I thought I was this little island of me. And once you start talking about these issues that more people wanted to talk about, but were completely shut out of the media environment, suddenly you realize there was an audience for that. There were others like me, they felt shut out of debate, and that they flocked to my sites and others like it. And so we quickly moved from being passive consumers of information to creators of content ourselves. And we were facilitated by new low cost and zero cost technology. We had grabbed a domain name, what was it, 895 at GoDaddy at the time, set up a blogger site, free. Next thing you knew, you were wondering out loud about whether those aluminum tubes that Colin Powell was talking about really meant what they thought they meant. And you discovered that there were thousands of other people wondering the same thing, and that they had their own questions to ask. They added their own specialized information, and we had scientists and doctors and lawyers and veterans and housewives and people from all comers of life discussing these issues and bringing their particular expertise to that debate. And lo and behold, we had a new participatory, collaborative form of media where no one voice dictated the truth and where everyone was open to challenge. Even on a site like Daily Coast, which is considered sort of an echo chamber, you couldn't write something with people demanding, prove it. So is your work. Where's the link? New voices emerged in this environment. And it was funny, because when the beginning of this process, people thought, well, these bloggers have to be somebody famous. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the blogger Atrios, Duncan Black. Uh, at the time, when he was pseudonymous, people thought, well, he must be Sid Blumenthal, right? <laughs> It's got to be Sid Blumenthal, because it couldn't be some random guy that no one had ever heard of. So when he finally came out and said, I'm Duncan Black, people were like, who? And when I came out and said, I'm Marcos Melissas, people were like, what? <laughs> we weren't known names. We didn't have money. We didn't have famous parents. We didn't have any coattails to write off. We were able to succeed because we had a voice that met a market need, because the media had failed. So Daily Coast grew, and there's several factors that allow Daily Coast to grow over those first uh, several years. One, like I said, we filled the market void. Uh, there was a dearth of strong, progressive voices in the media landscape. Second, we nurtured new voices. I didn't come into it thinking, Daily Coast, that's the name of the site. Uh, I, I thought that was a temporary name. I never thought it would actually stick. I just couldn't think of something good. So from the beginning, I ended up promoting editors to the front page, because I didn't want it to just be about me. I wanted to expand that roster of voices. But what was really amazing as Daily Coast evolved and the diaries became a really strong component is that the diaries themselves became a strong incubator of new voices. And just yesterday, we heard the fantastic news that Nate Silver has been picked up by the, uh, by the New York Times. Uh, his content's being licensed for the next three years. Daily Nate Silver actually began as Poblano on the Daily Coast diaries. Very, very proud of that like a proud papa. And we celebrated authority, but it wasn't the fake authority of traditional news organizations uh, that just because you work for the New York Times, therefore you're credible. It was a different kind of authority. It was, it was actual authority. It's people who did have that expertise, whether they were veterans, like me discussing logistical issues in the run-up to the Iraq war, I could talk about that from a position of authority because I was a veteran who would focus in my service on logistical issues. Uh, how many traditional news reporters actually have military service? They don't. So they are more susceptible to military spin. And on issue after issue, whether it's healthcare and people who are nurses and doctors and uh, healthcare providers talking about the difficulties of working within an existing system, or whether it's talking about energy issues and having geologists, geologists talk about what's happening in the Gulf and the difficulties of dealing with that problem, there is this incredible pool and wealth of expertise in the site, tens of thousands of people who, who know more about any topic than anybody else. And there's no way traditional news organizations can actually compete against that sort of pooled collaborative level of expertise. But fourth, while we celebrated that authority, we didn't demand it. 
So the site was open. We didn't need to have permission. I still get emails from people saying, I want to submit something to Daily Codes. Can I do it? Not realizing that this is a new way of doing media where you don't need permission to participate as long as your topic is in tune with the Daily Coast mission, then you're more than welcome to. I don't care if you post or you don't post. I don't care if I agree with you on a particular issue or don't. It's an open system. And what that did is it created a community. And that community is the single biggest reason by far that Daily Coast is what it is. And I'll get back to some of those factors that allow that community to grow. But I'm going to sort of step back a little bit again. And uh, Daily Coast is, like I said, eight years old. And it has grown. Uh, in a time of incredible media upheaval. Uh, I mean, go back eight years, ten years, I mean, the media landscape today is completely unrecognizable compared to what it was ten years ago. And now what we're seeing even in the last year is that the lines are blurring. Actually, the lines are gone. Uh, is there much difference between blogs of new media and old media organizations? How is TPM, Talking Points Memo, any different now than the New York Times? They both report. How is the Huffington Post different from the Washington Post when you look at the comment sections and the, and the, the uh, talkback functions, the, the interactive functions, uh, video, print, all of that is completely jumbling and blurring and, and lines are eliminated. And what you have now is more of an amalgamation of media. I mean, you look at people like Dave Weigel, who used to be at the uh, Washington Independent, it's now at the Washington Post. He's now, he went from a new media organization to an old media one, but he's doing the exact same thing. It's completely unrecognizable from, I mean, completely recognizable from what it was before. So what is left is convergence. Convergence of platforms, convergence of writers and readers, and convergence of purpose. And this convergence is being recognized in lots of different ways, not just in layout and presentation, but in who's being invited to discuss issues on television, who is sitting in the White House asking questions. I mean, you can remember, what was it, a year ago that Sam Stein asked that question at a White House press briefing, and it was like huge news. A blogger asked a question in the White House. Now it's routine. Now nobody gives a shit anymore. Oh, there's Sam Stein asking another stupid question, right? It's hard to believe now, but talking points memo, Founder Josh Marshall had to hit up readers for money to cover the 2004 uh, presidential primary in New Hampshire. Now he's got this incredibly large and growing stable of reporters. And he's part of the monthly press pool covering the president. So now you look at the traditional media outlets. Once upon a time, they published at a certain schedule, the morning edition, or the, if they were an evening paper, the evening edition, 6 o'clock news. Now they publish immediately to the web. And by the time print readers read that story. The online, online version has evolved. It's been updated. New links have been added. Corrections have been made. Traditional outlets are also picking up new talent, new media talent, like the Ezra Kleins and the Dave Weigels, and so on, and the Nate Silvers. So as news flows and it morphs and changes in real time, it's hard to tell what's dead tree copy and what is online only. And really, at the end of the day, nobody cares anymore except the accountants trying to hold on to this dead or dying revenue model. So more and more, what sets old media apart from new media isn't just form, it's brands and niches. Daily Coast itself is basically a niche site. That's how we built our own brand. And rather than do original reporting, we do that sometimes, but rather than do that, we aim to explain a confusing and, and uh, difficult political process. We're more into the explanatory side of the media uh, divide. So whether it's breaking down parliamentary procedure, digging into a congressional district's demographic, breaking down complex financial reform legislation, we go far beyond what the traditional media considers political news and actually deeply explains it. So you're not going to hear about Al Gore and Tipper Gore on Daily Coast. You're going to hear about things that actually matter. <laughs> and rather than pretend that we speak for America, like 99% of pundits, uh, we decided to make a habit out of asking Americans what they thought. So there's no worse phrase to me in, in, in media than the American people think, right? And everybody loves to say that, right? You watch the Sunday morning talk shows, the American people think. Politicians love that. If there's polling to support what you're saying, then fantastic. But most of the time, there isn't. We decided to invest heavily in polling because being a grassroots organization where people have a voice, we decided we couldn't in all conscience be an organization that dictated what we thought to the rest of the, of the public. We were going to find out what they really thought. 
So we started polling in 2007. And it was a very radical concept at the time. But for a site focused on grassroots empowerment, that was our way to get the pulse of the nation. In 2008 and 2009, Daily Coast commissioned more polling than any other media organization in this country, by far, not even close. This year, we'll end up polling 200 races and issues. It was our polling that first popularized the notion that the Tea Party uh, protesters thought that Obama was really born in Kenya. It proved that the health care law wasn't political suicide for Democrats, and that's playing out as this election cycle uh, uh, progresses. It showed that insurgents could challenge the party establishment in primaries and win. And it's now showing that Democrats aren't as doomed in November as the pundits desperately want them to be. But most of all, it created a culture in which we don't make assumptions about what people think. And like I said, the media establishment likes to pretend that they speak for everybody else. And they willed this conventional wisdom as though it's the truth. Uh, and it really drives people like me insane. And again, that's one of the reasons that Daily Coast has, uh, ex has succeeded, because it has tapped into that frustration. It has turned the top bottom model upside down. And it's not just us, of course, which is why new media poses such an existential threat to old media outlets that don't evolve with the times. And I think the future of news is multiple sources and platform and healthy and enthusiastic communities feeding information and interpretation to each other in an environment that embraces such collaboration. In order to nurture those communities, one needs to design their media website, not just for information distribution, but for social activity as well. And building a so successful community requires understanding these tenets. And this is what I look to as I continue to expand and nurture the Daily Coast community. Because like I said, this is the most important tenet of our success. One, you must appeal to ego. And I mean that in the least uh, judgmental and insultive way possible. People want to be recognized. They want to be appreciated. They want to be validated and they want to know that they matter. And a community that allows them to, to essentially create themselves as personalities is gonna be more successful. People wanna feel empowered. In a broader sense, they wanna feel like they're making a difference and improving or, or being an active particip participant in something that they care about. For politics, obviously, that's very obvious. Uh, but even, I, I'm a founder of uh, Sports Blogs Nation, SBNation.com, uh, which is funded by Comcast of all uh, lovely, uh, people, uh -huh. and, uh, and um, what we find, again, is that people want to partake in the things that they're passionate about, and in sports, really there was no way in, in a world, media world, that's dominated by the ESPNs for the average fan, unless you were calling into a talk show radio, talk radio show, uh, really no way to be heard, unless, you know, unless you're hanging out in a bar with your friends, and sort of these kind of communities that, in, that allow that engagement and uh, people that come together and feel like they're part of something are very successful. But in the narrow, narrower sense also, uh, empowerment means giving people the tools to control their community. And Daily Coast and Larts, one of the, I think, biggest uh, factors to its community growth was I turned over its moderation to itself. I don't moderate the Daily Coast community. 99.9% uh, .9 of, of, say, bannings and, and decisions of that like come from the community itself enforcing its own morals. They've, they've established their own culture and they enforce that culture and I let it happen. I just sit back and uh, it can get ugly, but sitting back and letting it happen feels people gives people the feeling that they are actually part of that and they feel ownership to the point where I change the font color on the headline and they tell me to fuck off and what the hell are you doing to my site? So, and that's a good thing. Then you gotta facilitate information exchange, which is obvious. Informa communities come to a community because they're interested in certain kind of information. You wanna make it easy for them to find it, to share, to collaborate, and to push that information out to the world. And four, you wanna encourage connections. This is of course what Twitter and Facebook are really all about, it's pretty obvious stuff. But what was, what's amazing, like, like a site like Daily Coast, is that these connections don't flow upwards, right? This is not, when you talk about bottom up, right, you, you think you're moving to the top, right? These people aren't making connections to me. I'm not a cult leader. I don't rule over these people and tell them what to do. But they flow sideways to each other in different directions, in infinite directions. So these are the elements that have allowed me to build the most engaged community online. And, and that's not just an idle boast. I mean, Pew, study uh, Pew's Project for Excellence in Journalism. They have their annual State of the Media uh, report. 
and in the 2010 edition, they reported that Daily Kills averages 48 minutes per person per visit, the Drudge Report nearly an hour. Five, that's five times the average news site, and the other sites range between five and 25 minutes per person. So a daily cost at 48 minutes is almost double the number three site. And Drudge is not a community site. He does what he does very effectively. For community sites, daily cost is double the next community site. It's because community. It's the way you, you build and engage that community. Now, this desire for community isn't just idealism. How can today's news organizations manage this sort of tidal wave flow of information without that extra help. We are flooded with videos and podcasts and Twitter observations and Facebook entries, traditional news sources and items that used to be out of reach of the average person, like databases, government reports, think tanks analysis, polls. Do you really want a detailed reporter to cover Sarah Palin's Facebook page? You don't. This variety itself is crying out for community collaboration, collation, and curation. We piece together the news these days. We discover within large communities and within niche communities what interests us. Together with today's tools, we make sense of the world around us in a way that simply wasn't possible before, and that is the future media, collaborative, multimedia, and accessible to the masses. Those organizations that open themselves up to new voices, new talent, new ways of facilitating the free flow of information and communication, not one way or two way, but infinite ways, will thrive in this new democratized world. Thanks. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you.